So tonight we'll talk about the process, the role of the loan officer and the processor. And I know I, I've told you guys this before, kind of what the mortgage transaction coordinator does for the loan officer. Uh, it's really a sales assistant, and it helps it helps uh, make the, the process more efficient for the loan officer to generate and, and increase their volume. So. Uh, after we talk about that, we'll talk about more about the loan submission form the stack in order. And I'm going to have Cecilia, our senior loan processor here, uh, talk more about that. And I'll introduce her and give her the role here. But I want to kind of give you guys an overview of the agenda. And after she's done, she's going to take off. Um, and I was hoping to introduce our other team member, uh, Amy Dang and Jeanette Mitchell, but they couldn't stay. Um, but Cecilia is. And she's going to kind of cover the first half of tonight's training. I'll cover the preliminary title report, the desktop originating, the pre approval letter, along with the LOEs. So that's what you guys are going to learn tonight on how to submit a file and she'll kind of explain, uh, so she'll explain what uh, she's looking for on a clean submission. The cleaner your submission, the less conditions you're going to get from the underwriter and the quicker you're going to close and the quicker you can get paid. So you want a clean submission up front. Um, and I'm going to show, uh, I'm going to kind of navigate for Cecilia uh, while she kind of talk uh, here. And let me just make sure here. If you guys, um, so kind of a little background about Cecilia. Uh, Cecilia has been processing since 2003, so she's going on her first decade here, going uh, processing there. She she does not only um, process the file, but she actually will pre-underwrite it uh, in the sense that she'll tell you, hey, these are missing. You're absolutely going to get uh, a turn down or, or certain things where she'll help you before you get the official denial letter. So it's better to get, and there's truly uh, three status that you guys got to be aware of. One is uh, the approval. It's been approved. It's a conditional loan approval. There's always some type of condition, whether it's on the property, the borrower, disclosure, the underwriter. There's always some type of uh, uh, condition, and that's conditional loan approval. Collectively, we just call it approval. Then you've got your denial where a, uh, based upon what they request, the borrower, it just couldn't get approved. Then you have this, this kind of hanging decision. It's called a suspended loan. And it's suspended, meaning it, it hasn't been approved, hasn't been denied, is subject to additional information for them to make that determination. So uh, in our eyes is that uh, we, don't, we don't want denial. We want either approval or suspension, an opportunity for us to get that approval. So I'm proud to say that Cecilia uh, the last, I think, year or two, she doesn't get any denial, or I, I would say any, probably one or two out of the hundreds that she does. She also gets some type of suspension or approval. And that's because she stopped the file before it uh, even become jump to the lender where they would deny the file. So that's the type of experience and the, the expertise that you're going to be working with. And she's going to kind of uh, talk you through it on how she would like to see the file so that she can still maintain that record and get you guys to build more views. Because here's the problem, if you insist on, on actually submitting that file when she knows that they're going to um, you're wasting everybody's time. You're wasting uh, the process of resources here. You've got a bottleneck where good loans are, are you know, waiting for yours to go through. Lenders get there, they're going to disclose it. Borrowers going to get an official letter saying it's denied. They might pose a problem if it goes to a different lender, especially with FHA, because it's connected to FHA. Any decision, everybody sees it. So, do yourself and the client a favor uh, and make sure that uh, that you submit it cleanly and take notes tonight. So I'm gonna, uh, without further ado, I'm gonna pass it on to Cecilia and she's gonna put a bit more, uh, let me go through the chart and she'll start off with the uh, duties and responsibilities. So if you can kind of flip to that and I'm gonna go and bring it on the screen for you guys to see it at, uh, at home. So basically what I did is I split the loan officer duty and the processor duty into half. As you can see that um, on the what, my left, you're right, uh, that you will see that two duties, yeah. you know, process does certain things and, and role office does certain things, it's always in there. So you guys know that uh, over the escrow when you have a little, especially purchase that goes to the sellers, so we don't do that. So we we, we open escrow as a processor uh, and we, we go ahead and we look at the list, it's just simple steps that we do for a process. So loan officer, you have to be really careful what you guys do on the loan officer end because there's a lot of stuff that falls under you guys that a lot of loan officers assume processor does, but we don't know because we're not licensed uh, agent to to lock rates for you, to put rates for you, to, to, to 
do um, to complete a loan application. We can help you build a loan application if you if you as uh, if we actually take out TC service. We can help you build it, but we cannot complete the whole loan application for you. Okay, so here, here's simply a list. I think Kim actually went through some of these with you guys already. Um, at, where are you at? Sorry, can you speak up for people in the back? Uh, okay, so I said, where, where are you at on your S4s? Right now, we're, we're at the uh, submission. So if you take a look at um, where we're at, the probably five, the complete the build on application space right now. So that's where five. we are at number five. Okay, so once you complete number five, it hands up to the uh, process. So the process will go ahead and submit to the lenders. And then after the lenders uh, approve it, then it goes in to uh, PTD, which we call by to docs, that you have to satisfy conditions. It's the condition approval list. So what we basically do as a processor, we'll call you the approval. And then a lot of processors does not tell you what you need to do. It's the law officer duty to actually redo the approval and say, okay, I need to get this, I need to get this, and I need to get that. But I like to highlight stuff for you guys to make it easier. So you don't have to guess what you have to do. So normally on the lower approval, I will highlight everything you need to get for me so I can clear docs for you guys. Okay, so anything that's highlighted in yellow, when I say in the approval, it's your job to get it. For the bar, for whoever. If you have a question about those conditions, always have to, always email me. Just email me as they say, what does this mean? Because lenders conditions can mean something else where uh, it's a simple item, but they spell out like, you know, uh, in the world, in the living world. And, and of course, we have to translate to a bar terms. Then they will understand what the LOE means. We need to get letters explaining that, what the decor is, uh, what's the latest, and all that stuff. So once you give me all the uh, prior to the conditions, I'll go ahead and submit them along with the third party. As a uh, processor head of third parties like escrow, appraisal, um, Items that's related to insurance. And once you get us the quote, we'll go ahead and find it for you. We'll do all that. That does not require one of our uh, the responsibility to give to us. So you take care of the borrower, we take care of the third party. Once we have all those items together, then we submit everything together to the lender to clear docs. The lender does not like to piece mail. So you can send them separate email if you like, but I don't like sending pieces of conditions to them to have everything together, okay? So, uh, again, again, appraisal orders for us and all that stuff. So with doc orders, what I do is that I will send you a, uh, what they call a doc order form. It's something I put together. I will fill everything out and you need to sign it to verify this is what you're charging. Well, we just want to make sure we put all the docs. Because when docs go out, we can't change it. So, um, so say that you want to charge one and a half on the letter Make sure I put one and a half spell out the dollar amount, the process of fee, what still need to pay before closing, what still need to pay after closing. Like credit report will be issued fee, will be on there because it's paid by the borrower. So all you have to do is sign and acknowledge it so I can order docs. I don't order docs unless you acknowledge that's what you want to charge the borrower. So, um, so of course, before order docs, you have to go in the lock, right? Um, once you once you submit the file to me, I will have you sign up for the lender's login. You should have some of the lender login before uh, I will get hired. But for those who doesn't, say like you want to submit to Freedom, you don't have a login. By the time you submit to me, I will have you log in, so you can actually log in and log the right. And for some people who doesn't not know how to navigate um, lender logins to log right, uh, there are lenders that. Lock person, you just email them and say, hey, can you lock the lender right for me? Instead of go online and all that stuff. And I can't advise you which one does that not. Okay, so once that goes out, uh, what they usually do is schedule a signing with the borrower. The escrow usually does that. Uh, escrow does not like us to schedule something when they don't have the complete documents ready to go. To go. So they like to be the one who's scheduled and signing. So we normally just tell escrow to schedule a signing for us. Once they prepare the doc signing, um, they will send what's called estimated hazard clause. 
And this is what you would need to do to review with the client. You would need to go over the fees, uh, make sure that they understand what they're being charged and all that stuff, and they're okay with this fee. Now, sometimes they're like, you know, I did not agree to this, and, and all of a sudden we have to go back to the lender and say, we draw the office, correct this, give them this credit, and everything has to go through what they had to do with the lender. So if anything changes, uh, after the doctor's draw, it has to go back to the lender. And that will delay a day or two, and then your law might be up. So it's, great, it's, it's good to know exactly what you're, what you're trying to borrow. You more need to understand what they can charge. I normally can do a what they call an estimate closing fee sheet for you uh, right before dock so you can see, see the um, estimate have cash you closed they need to bring in. It's always estimate because I don't have to find a favorite. That's what always does. I can give you a closing map. So if you say, so yeah, can you give me a closing fee sheet so I can know is estimate how much they getting before docs, the order docs? I can do that for you. And then, of course, funding conditions after they sign the docs, and then there's a lot of conditions uh, requires to fund the loan. And for table funding lender, they don't have this. Okay? They fund the day they sign the documents. So there are a few funding lenders out there that still does this. And then, of course, closing the file up, uh, you will actually have to, uh, if there's any missing documents, we need to submit to auditing to close up the files so against kick and pay. I will email you and say, hey, I'm missing this particular disclosure. Can you send it to me? Sometimes these documents does not require follow. It's just something internal that to you some idea or to close out the files. Okay. And those are your part of the duty after the uh, submission to the processor. And these are the items that actually I would do for you as well as the processor. And if you notice that we actually put in the pricing here for conventional and FHA VA versus mortgage and USDA loans. And again, process fee are not paid by you guys, they're all paid by the properties on the fee sheet. It was a process fee on there, or a origination flat fee on there. Okay. And the Kevin can explain to you. Uh, one thing I want to uh, make sure you guys are aware of is that. A lot of uh, people will process their own loan, which is fine. You can do it just to make sure that it works. I'm kind of kneeling now just to be in the frame of this camera. But um, processing is included in all the deals, and you're gonna you're not gonna pay for it. So it's a service that's already being paid by by the borrower. Might as well use it. So we want to make sure that you guys there there are a lot of people that will babysit and massage their borrower, spend a lot of time making it perfect, which is fine. I know you want to make sure that it flows, but she can probably uh, do it faster and better uh, for you and actually give you more time to do what you guys are really doing. You guys are sales, and we got operation, which is processing and TCs and all that stuff. So stick with what you guys do best, which is sell. Go out there, originate loans, and, and focus on that. But I just want to be clear, it's going to be paid no matter what, guys. So just make use of that, and, and uh, the people were, were confused with well, I'm going to pay 650. Can I just process myself? It doesn't. It's paid by the borrowers included, regardless. Okay. Now, what I wanted to talk to you about again. I know I, I introduced this to you guys before with the TC service, but um, a lot of people are coming to us right now. They they have files, and I know that we're we're at as far as a whole mortgage division. We're very young. We're revamping the whole mortgage division right now, uh, making it restructure and all that. But even though mortgage always been here. We do it a little bit differently. So, so people aren't quite sure on, on what to do at this point. So they're coming here, and, and then, uh, what we're offering is the TC service, just so you guys can see the benefit of it without paying anything. It's going to be free for the month of September for the first spot. Now, what that means is that they will do everything for you just for you guys to get a, uh, you know, get a taste of it and, and know what you're paying into. But if you look at all those things, not number one, six, eight, and nine, whether you do a TC service or not, uh, those are your responsibility. But if you don't, you got to do everything from one down through 15. Uh, those are loan officer duties. All we're introducing is an assistant that can help the loan officer with some of those 15 tasks. And there's a lot more tasks, which is kind of broken down into a very uh, common general term. If you guys wanted to do that, uh, 
Again, you still need to do the 1, 6, 8, and 9. And the, uh, for, for 1 through 11, that's the 495. So people were confused that why am I paying 495 plus 650? That's 1100 bucks, you know, 1200 dollars. It's not, guys. So you, the 650 is paid by the borrower, the 495 is actually paid by you guys, will be invoiced outside of escrow. You will get paid by ERS, then you will receive an invoice from central processing saying you need to pay this. Okay, it's just for compliance reasons, we have to do it that way. All right? And uh, the other one I want to explain that, which is called the a, a, a la carte uh, the premium. In addition to the 495, if you wanted them to do just one of the four, then you can see the pricing on the side here. And then if you wanted to do, but the most we'll ever charge total is 200. So if you ever do maybe uh, one of the 12 or 13 and one of the 14, 15, that'll total 200 already. Just because you do all this work, not going to be the, any more than 200. So the max of the TC will be 695. Okay. So we want to introduce that because we're getting a lot of, 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 of kind of question on the fees, on, on why. What are the fees? So on here is optional. This is not mandatory at all. You guys can do everything from, from 1 through 15. But if you guys are, are less operation and more sales and want to be on the field, enjoy talking to people, learning people's business, do that. And then just kind of let the back off, like the back office work on, on, on the side of your property. Um, it, and then one other thing is that um, there is a mentorship that I want to cover for you guys. And yeah, this is where um, I know that we've been working on this here. Um, the way that we have it set up for ERS is that every branch have a branch owner. That branch owner would uh, provide support for the loan officer. Uh, and for the sake of, of this class, we're just going to talk about loan officer. I know we have insurance agent or real estate agent. But for this sake, we talk about just the mortgage insurance, uh, sorry, mortgage consultant when I talk about agent. Okay. So the broke the, the branch owner supports all of the their agents, uh, the loan consultant, and if they can, if they do not have that background uh, to support them, or they prefer to send it to corporate for training, that's fine. Uh, we're going to build a mentorship program where we're going to have certified mentors. Right now, we don't have anybody but me right now until we get actually get certified. Okay, but uh, again, my thing is I want to see if there's anybody that recruit maybe from another company. Uh, that has the experience and the expertise. All we need to do is just train them on ERS process. That's one. So look out for any any qualified mentor that you guys know in your branch or somebody that's kind of joining the, the team. They can get paid for that. Um, and that, that mentorship is meant for training. Hands on, here's your file. I'm going to give you a roadmap. I'm going to walk you through every single step of those 15 tasks that you got to do. I'll walk you through everything. And we'll, make, and we'll split 50-50 on that, on that deal. That's what the mentor will have in it, and he'll hold it all the way. Um, the TC service, they do all that, but they don't train you, okay? So they just do it. You give it to them, and we're not gonna sit down and teach you how to do it. It's just gonna be a service that does it for you. So the difference between mentor is, kind of, I, I revert to that saying, you can teach a man how to fish, right? Or you give a man a fish, or you can teach him. TC is you give a man a fish, and then mentorship, you teach him how to fish. Right? So that's kind of what you guys got to keep in mind. You can keep paying this 495 all you want, or do you want to just kind of pay the mentor and learn to do it yourself? Now don't get me wrong, once you get your, your volume so high and, and you're, you're very, very busy and you're really good at sales and you've got tons of loan going in, you will need a system. You will need the TC service. So the TC service doesn't mean that it's for newbies. It can be for a seasonal loan offer bringing up their volume to or increasing their production. Okay. So that's kind of what, what I wanted to distinguish through the mentorship. Uh, we'll teach you how to do it, and your broker should be supporting you your right now. And if they can, great. But if you feel that uh, you want to take it another level and you want to get one of the, the ERS certified mentors to help you, that's fine too. It will split the commission with you, and it only works on the BBO model. So if you guys are on the BRE, if you're under, if you're under on the BRE, uh, uh, which means you have your salesperson's license and your NMLS, and you're hanging up there, and you're doing business under the uh, BRE, um, that, the mentorship not available on that side of the, the NMLF or the mortgage division. It's only available on your DBO, uh, which is on um, where uh, you only have your NMLS license, okay? So if, but, but the, the difference is if you have your seller person license, you have an option. You can actually either hang it with the BRE or the DBO, whereas if you only have the NMLS license, you have no option but to do so to be clear, 
if you want the mentorship, you actually cannot be uh, hanging your license and doing business under the DRE. Okay? So mentorship is 50-50. Uh, that means you still get 75 basis points for, for doing a loan. So you get actually get paid for, for bringing a lead, but you gotta work it. They'll, they'll walk you through all that. Um, and the TC service, that will uh, will be through them. They just do it. However, because like I explained to you guys before, is that there's only me right now that does the mentorship. Uh, Cecilia uh, been with me for the last 10 years doing uh, doing that. So she understands we I mean, we think alike. So what I'm doing is uh, anybody that does take advantage of the September uh, for, first file for free, she will set aside roughly how how much time are you spending with each other right now? About 30 to 40 minutes. So the the way that is kind of hybrid between the TC where they just do it versus mentorship, they train you how to do it. She will actually do the the processing and kind of explain as she as she's working, not as deep as the mentorship would, but it, it at least gets you going and she'll give you a roadmap on, on what the next step is. Okay. So take advantage of that. You have a lot, but it only works. It only, it only uh, applies when you have a live file. You can't just come and just say, hey, I want to do a mock file and do that. So you have, actually got to have a live file. And what we mean by that is you got to have your CIA, credit, income, and asset. Once you have that for a file, then you come see her. She'll walk you through the whole process on, on the next step. Um, and let me bring up one other thing here. Uh, what we're requiring is that in order for you and this is going to be uh, company-wide, all new, new loan officer will have to be mentored if they have not complete module one and two, uh, training session one and two. You got to just watch the video, guys. Watch the video. We give you a simple uh, three to five uh, questions. Not a trick question. I don't, you know, you probably can get the answer for somebody else, but the, be honest to yourself. You want to know how to do loans. And if you don't, get mentored. Learn how to do it. So we're going to require, if you haven't watched the video, and it's kind of, it's kind of, uh, it won't be implemented until we get all the video actually online. Okay, so right now, but I'm just letting you know the direction we're going is that there's a standard, and that's why all of you have to take the NMLS license. There's a standard of knowledge. You gotta pass with 70%. We're gonna have a standard of the way that everybody operates in ERS. So one officer should know exactly what everybody's doing. So that's the culture of the mortgage division is that you, everybody's gonna be at the same, uh, gonna be watching the same thing and, and kind of have the same knowledge base. So uh, unless they finish one or uh, the first two, they're going to be required to do mentorship. Okay, if until they finish one, two, three, and four, they're going to be required to do TC. So if you if you haven't done one and two, you you get a mentor and also get the uh, the mentor will be your TC, just so to speak, right? So they'll they'll help you do that. Then if let's say you did one or two and you said I don't want to I don't want to do mentorship, well then we're going to say do you know how to do a fee sheet? Do you know how to get the disclosure out? Because what's going to happen is that you don't know how to do disclosure, you do it all wrong, you meet the buyer uh, and the borrower, and she gets a call at 7 p.m. and she is going to say, the disclosure all wrong, can you help me? Can you just send this out, do this, I need to do it right now, save this deal. And that's what we're trying to prevent, that kind of you know fire mentality, put it out, and, you know, and, and it just we want to make sure everybody knows the fundamental on how to get disclosure done correctly. So until you, you, you finish those, and we're not doing any trick question, it's just three to five question, answer it, that means you took, you, you watched it, you, you passed. Um, so, so that's why right now, we're not implemented, but that's the direction, direction we're going. And this is where it would take us to uh, the five and six, uh, it's only the first four. Five and six is once you submitted processing, processor will help you along the way anyways. That's just the normal way. This. And, and, and uh, in essence, is that the first four are all loan officer duties. You should be doing this. If you're a loan officer, you need to know how to do this. Okay? And then if you don't, you need to hire a mentor or hire a transaction coordinator to do that. So I want to be clear with that for you guys. Now, I, I, I do want to make it an open discussion, and I'm going to kind of uh, go to the questionnaire here for those uh, watching the webinar. I wanted to ask you, what are your thoughts on, on us uh, mandating that they have to take these here? I feel strongly that there should be a, a standard with all the, the loan officer within DRS. Uh, we don't want any rogue you know, loan officer going out and doing something that might affect the whole company, where you all would have to, you know, if we shut down shop, you guys got all got to find a different company to work with. So that's what we're preventing for the whole. Uh, we don't want one bad apple to ruin it all for, for us, okay? So what, what, are, what are your feedback, your comment, what do you guys think about us mandating mentorship 
if they do not finish the first two modules. Mandating uh, TC service if they do not finish the first four modules. What, what are your thoughts? And there's, there's no wrong answer, right or wrong answer. Would people, would people with experience be excluded from that? Like people who, who've already been a loan officer before, would they be excluded from that? Yeah, uh, yes, and I think there, there would be a grandfather, meaning that once we implement it, everybody who's been with the company would probably just be grandfathered and just everybody new and purely into the system. I'm going to make it simple. But then we'll do on a, so be clear, cut and dry. So um, the, the question, in case you guys at home didn't hear it, was would this would there be any grandfathering clause, meaning for existing LO, would they be mandated to do this? The, the answer is no. We're going to set a date, and all new hire with a start date after that date will be subject to. But anybody before, which is you guys here, everybody here, we're not going to do that to you guys. But um, at the same time, if we keep getting the same kind of, I, I call it rookie mistake, if we keep getting that, then we're going to say, you know, uh, we're probably, your, your file's going to probably get put back on the, on the back burner just because of the way that you your sloppy submission and so forth. We'll figure out something, but we'll make it clear that, um, that the training will be required. Okay. All right, let's see here. Just read your notes. Um, yeah, all you guys are saying that you guys couldn't hear us. Sorry about that. I, um, I think you guys, we're fixed, we fixed that now. All right, now I'm going to uh, give it back to Cecilia. She, I just wanted to interject on the man, uh, mandating the training and the TC mentorship. <coughs> and we'll, we'll, we'll lead on to, well, we left off here on CC. Um, go ahead and tell her how to fill it out. What if they do this? Well, I kind of want to go back here for the uh, resubmission and the uh, here. This is if you were to decide to pull the file because it got denied by this lender and you want to submit to the lender, there will be a, a resubmission fee because everything has to be repackaged, new disclosure has to be sent out, all that stuff. This fee is not paid by the bar because the, pay bar, the bar is already set at 650. They are not going to pay an additional 150 for us to resubmit the loan because we, the loan officer did not know that this loan doesn't allow certain things. So resubmission fee will be paid by the law officer at close of escrow. So that breaks down to just, uh, I think it's covered by your commissions. It will be deducted from your, your check. Um, so your the, the resubmission fee is usually sometimes when you guys insist us setting the loan program, and that's loan off. Sorry about that. So if, if you guys insist on a, a lender being able to do a loan program and, and a processor. Again, the loan officer, uh, in most companies, loan officers say, hey, submit it, process just does what the loan officer says. What we do is we kind of, uh, she has she has product knowledge. She will tell you based on the lender's uh, guideline, can they do it or not. But she, she's not gonna do your job for you. You still are ultimately responsible for picking out the loan program. And if she submits it, loan officer denies it, and it was meant to go to a different lender with a different niche product, that's what a resubmission uh, is. So you got denied one place, or well, you withdrew it because maybe you locked it in and it expired. Rates got better. Instead of extending the lock and costing the borrower more money, you decide to cancel it, submit it to a different lender. That's a resubmission because they've already done all the work that required to submit to the lender, disclose, do all that, and then now we're going to have to do that again. So that this is a common uh, common fee, and you guys do that just the same as redraw. If you order documentation, rate lock expired, they didn't sign on time, the lender's going to charge you $150 to redraw the docs too. So they've been doing all that stuff. So that's, that is paid by you. That is that no fault of the borrower. Well, not necessarily, but for the most part, it, it's charged by the loan officer because we can't uh, charge the borrower that. Uh, but, but there's an extra work that, that uh, required. this column piece here. Um, very simple, I just need the borrower's name, uh, subject, and your full name, whether you're uh, DRE or uh, DOC. Check this. Uh, again, the standard is 495 and additional fee you will put in there and then total it up. Your first file, of course, if we told you guys September will be free, so we'll buy more signing off for your first file. You still have to fill it up every single file. 
And then UTC is only I'm assigned UTC, but it's me, Amy, or Jeanette with UTC. To, uh, to be clear, this is an optional form. If you don't want TC service, you don't have you to do fill this out. You don't have to fill this out. This, but you will, uh, it's actually, it actually helps you to kind of understand what you're doing. It's just a FYI, if you're not using the TC server, this is just so you know what an owner does and what a process does. Okay. okay, so we will go off from this one. So you need to fill out this as best as you can because we will go off this just to make it long. Anything you write here is, will be, will be, of course, we will be verified certain things like uh, type of property it is and stuff. So, uh, law officer, name, phone number, you know, that would like to, you like your condition approval sent to. I mean, you guys use different emails, some for real estate, some for loans. So, whatever you want, loan approval for your processor to contact you, that'll be the email you want. And uh, bonus email, you have to put one here because of disclosure issues. Learners require bonus email. If board does not have email, make one up for them. Go to gmail.com and do something. Um, create an email for them because we absolutely need at least one email address for our board. Okay? Subject property, uh, so, here. so here's the important part of the loan center. <coughs> uh, you need to check one of the boxes, uh, whether it's every channel or uh, conventional box, ESD. Other, um, other, you can check here and put in parentheses with others like commercial loans or um, apartment loans, uh, land loans, stuff like that. So you can put that here. Um, so the next thing is uh, rather what type of uh, 20 years, uh, 30 years, 14 years. Uh, go ahead and check one of those. Arm, um, I don't see many arms uh, over my there nowadays or anybody want an arm from but there is there. Uh, there is a death for jump loans. A lot of people use uh, those to do five, seven. Well, this is the purchase rate in terms of cash out. And then here's the type of property, occupations. Um, here's the short loan of the second mortgage. This is whether you are paying off the second mortgage or we are we supporting the second mortgage. Any for purchase that doesn't have a second, but if, you, if there's a purchase and you have a second, you can put it here and then kind of indicate what you want. Because we do have lender that's the, the student 801010. Okay, so there's still the lender that would do a second purchase. Uh, in Pally, yes or no, that's very important because uh, the disclosure we sent out needs to be in Pally account. So we need to know whether we are in Pally account or not. And of course, right here, in interest rate. We will go by this interest rate. If you have 5% here and you point say 875, I will use 5%. Okay, and then you, your borrowers will see a disclosure based on 5% sent to them from the market. Okay, so you need to be sure that this is correct. Um, here's the, the law officer. Um, this is kind of something that you would do if you, if you use TC service. Uh, you would want to let us know whether you're having uh, well, in the closing cost, zero cost to close, or you will have to all pay for the closing cost. And we can determine your actual uh, loan amount based on what you put on here. For TC, who actually does you the uh, disclosure for you? But if you already did the disclosure and you just submitted the loan to us, uh, this is not, uh, it's not applicable for process. We don't need to know about it. You know, we need to uh, uh, what, what your attention is for the call. Or, and then this kind of time with the uh, cash flows. So uh, lock rate, very important because whether you lock before submission or lock after submission. The reason why you need to lock, uh, you need to indicate whether you lock or not before you submit file. If you lock before you submit file, we have to include what they call lock GFE. And then if we don't include that lock GFE, our GFE is not in compliance. What some lender would totally reject your file we submit the whole thing if the GFE is not in compliance. Some money will allow you to fix it. Their there lender will say, nope, you didn't pass your RESPA the first time around. We submit everything. Okay. I know. <laughs> so, um, so whether you lock low before you submit the file, you need to let us know whether you, you lock it or not. So, 
it's a possible no method to improve a lot of GFE or not improve a lot of GFE. So this is very important, okay? Because when your file gets rejected, it takes, uh, lender will put your file behind you and it will take them 40 hours to, uh, to correct that disclosure, okay? Because once this disclosure is done, <coughs> well, then we can order a The disclosure is to indicate when we can go ahead and order. And of course, uh, here I added this part whether you're submitting corporate processing or you have your own branch processing. On the borrower pay and lender pay here, uh, I'm pretty sure Kevin kind of gone through the borrower pay and lender pay. So if you need to indicate whether your file is borrower pay or lender pay, you need to do that so we know how to do this course. Okay? And here, um, what we want here, origination, whether you do in borrower pay or not, I want to you guys to put how much you want to make, okay? Not necessarily what the lender comment. Say that, uh, I'll give you an example. Say that you want to make 2% and this lender, uh, and you pick lender pay. So you pick lender pay, 2%. And, I will, and then you pay, I don't know, let's say, we don't know what I used to do. So you did, you did this as a mission. I'm like, uh, no officer, no, because freedom does not do 2% that we pay. Okay, so so you need then you need to adjust your fee. So so now you know. Okay, so who and then depending on if you're if you like to make the 2% or you like freedom as your lender. And I was like, you know what? Uh, lender X does 2%. You want to send it there? Yeah. Okay. Fine. Send it to this lender instead because I want to make 2%. Okay. So we will be sending out lender comp plans for you guys so you guys can know exactly what is the lender comp plans. So if you were to pay for a pay, you can go ahead and do this and put in the YSP how much they're getting for the file. <coughs> and again, this is just an estimate because you can put 3% but then that day price is not 3%. It has no reason. But it, at least we know uh, that you actually put it in the whether there's a rebate or there's a cost at this time. Because that affects how we do the definition of uh, GFP to the funder. And if you are, here is if you're giving any credit towards the profit to close the business. Some, some, some law officers would like to give the uh, appraisal fee back to them. So you put down their number and you want to give back. And that would indicate how much I want to give towards the So uh, here's the lender's name. You put freedom in, and I mean these forms is really uh, for the purpose of submitting your own echo. We don't have this fill out. We go back and forth asking you for stuff, and then that will delay your process to submit your loans. And loans have to be submitted by 2 p.m. to count it that day submissions. If you send it after 2 p.m., don't expect it to be processed until the next. Lender has a two uh, Okay. So escrow um, for people who does not open has not opened escrow yet, you can put your escrow uh, name here and the phone number, and we'll open escrow for you. If you already have open escrow, just let us know who you did it, and we'll follow up with the trailer. Because you can open escrow and they don't have the bill for you until like two days later. But you can go ahead and submit it. I do not need a trailer for submission. Make sure you don't hold off your submissions for a pre I will I will follow up with your escrow. If you put an escrow number here, I will follow up with that. When the printer will come in. Because okay. some lender does not require printer for submission. But I will like a printer before you push the file. I wanna uh, I wanna make sure you guys understand the importance of having the borrower's email address because everything is uh, disclosed electronically nowadays. <laughs> And um, it, it, what the electronic disclosure does is waive the mandatory three-day uh, waiting period for, for them to, in, in essence, if you mail it, the post office can take up to three days and that's the logic behind that three-day waiting period. If I were to send out uh, something by mail, it can't take up to three days. So if we can deliver the same disclosure in a faster method by email, we always do that. And that's why we require the email. It will save three days uh, for everybody. So make sure they don't have it. 
um, you know, uh, and I keep referring back to kind of my, my, my community. Um, they don't necessarily use computers. Uh, you know, they, they're older generation or just to, don't have access to the internet. So just create one for them, make sure they understand that, you know, they can access somewhere else, but just give them the password. And I usually just do a generic password for them to understand, and then they can always change it later. But be clear, it's a fine line between fraud and not. You can create them an email address, but you can't go in there and accept it. Does that make sense? So make sure that you create it for them, give them an account, give them the password, have them change it, tell them to acknowledge it. Okay? So uh, if you're not using our TC service, these are required by you to be sent to us when you're ready to submit a file. Um, you will email everything to uh, central processing at myinformation.com. You can fax it to my uh, processing fax number. You can, of course, mail it to this office here. Uh, Kevin's going to later show you how to upload documents into point so you don't have to email a big file. Like, say, So you don't have to, because uh, sometimes my email is like, can I send it on the 10? And then there's certain things that's uh, encrypted that didn't come through. So you want to ensure that I have everything for submission, upload the uh, files for it. It's easier that way. And it's fax too. You don't have to wait for it to download. So um, here's the fax emails. And here's the complete list that I need for submissions. Uh, we'll go over this complete. Uh, of course, the submission form we just went through, at point file, you can either read the point or you can save on the server. Um, you, guys are, um, you guys are probably used to having a lot of feature with your current Kaylee's Point version. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to make the announcement kind of after this, but since we're talking about it, uh, Kaylee's Point is sent to us live now. So you're, you guys, whoever have Kaylee's Point, uh, let me know. And if there is a tweak, I gotta go into your computer to fix it. Um, and then every new user will, will, will have it by default. Um, so you upgrade to nine. There's no longer well, uh, your, so a lot of your access is gonna be restricted because of the company structure, and all of your loan is gonna be saved to the point data server. Uh, right now, you have the full-on, you know, uh, kind of uh, I guess single version, and then now we're gonna do point central. So the benefit. Of losing your your rights on, on certain admin stuff that you probably don't even use anyways is that you gain all of our templates, you gain all of our maintenance, you gain all of the uh, expertise, you get the online storage documentation, you got all that, which I'll cover that. Um, so you won't be able to email uh, from from that anymore. You won't be to, you won't have that function anymore. It will be disabled on purpose, uh, just for security purpose of people going out to our server and emailing out uh, other people's. Okay, so for, for this, the PCF file, which is always talking about, uh, for for you guys, for your sake, is that make sure that's on your, on the point data server, the central, uh, point central, that's all you need to do. Make sure it's in the right one. And I'll, I'll go over that in more detail. I say, um, you would probably have to just give me a simple email and say, uh, I like the uh, last name on the file and uh, submissions. So no attachment, no points, just uh, if you attach all those important documents to Hot Point, you don't intend to need to attach all these to the email. Just send uh, emails to central processing, say uh, I filed the last name on the subject and the submissions. And I will go in and I'll retrieve it. And what I do is I will move your file to the processing. So you will no longer see your file to in the least part of it because it's now submitted. So it will be the processing. And uh, as we go through the process of submissions, we will update each of those files. So, mm -hmm. so when we submit the file, we will check submitted. If we have order appraisal, we will check appraisal order. And there was a date there that we actually could do that when we submit your file, when we submit your file. And I will put notes if there's notes needed, say that this one in particular that you choose is now five day term track. I will say ETA five day term track for submissions. So you know it's not your actual normal two days. Um, they're less low now, so a lot of those are looking at two or three days. Okay. So the next thing uh, you will need to upload is, the, of course, the uh, 10.03 and uh, 
10 to 3, um, the last page of 10 to 3, you need to sign it. Okay, be sure that you sign the 10 to 3. Uh, sign and date this disclosure. I actually listed a bunch of disclosure here. But again, if you're on the server, it's all broken into one for you. So you don't have to be sure what you need out there. So Kevin, I'll go over that with you once uh, you have that out for you. So, um, Here's the tricky one for the lender disclosure requirements. Um, every lender has its own set of disclosure. So if you, you find a price and then you don't know what disclosure they did, email us. As they say, I was going to uh, call Taylor. What are the disclosure requirements? We'll send you all the disclosure requirements for that lender. So you, because this is the lender that you haven't worked with. So every lender you, you submit to have some sort of disclosure. Decide what's on the part. They have that all. So make sure you email us, ask us what disclosure is needed on top of it. Because you don't want to go back to the boss and say, hey, I missed this one. Can you sign this? Yeah. Um, that would delay you, of course, uh, another company. So make sure you have your income. That we based on uh, this thing here. He asked it two months past the end. You quarter report. Uh, Homeowner insurance, if they have property, they all move. IDs. Uh, so security for SP, we normally don't need social security card for conventional loan, but if you have a vision loan, you can provide social security card. Or for streamline, they don't need that, but you can use the V2, just FYI. Okay. And of course, purchase contract for purchase and prelim if you haven't done it yet. So um, I break down a conventional loan disclosure. So these are the disclosures you would need them to sign when you submit them all. So um, first couple of files uh, I would check if you guys have any of these. Okay. If there are, they're all needed, and if they don't, I'll kick it back to you. So you will see email from me saying kick back, and then when the subject line will be crossed, and I'll say, you're missing this, this, and this. So you know that I'm not holding up your files because I don't have these documents. So I rather send it back to you within an hour or two, so you miss something. What's the the letter? Wait three days and figure out you actually missed something. Okay. FHA, of course, is additional to these. So FHA <coughs> is like there are about forty pages of disclosure for FHA loan, and of course, precious has additional disclosure. Okay, so uh, Lynn, I'm sorry, but I'm not sure if you heard. Um, Cecilia earlier, I, I was thinking maybe that was a while back. But yes, you will. The question is, will you still be able to print the pipeline report? You will be. Um, and the, the 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 way it works is that uh, you know since I'm here, I'm going to pull up Kevin's point central for you guys to to see it. Uh, you'll be able to you'll be able to uh, only see your own pipeline. So we have different levels. As a producing load officer, you'll you'll be able to see your own pipeline. Um, as a team builder, you'll be able to uh, see your, your downline pipeline, and that's upon your branch owner's discretion. So not all team builders will have it. It's just maybe certain power team builders or, or somebody has to do mentorship. But we'll have a team builder view that can uh, not write, but they can just read their own or, uh, view. Then we're going to have a processing level <coughs> if you guys choose to. And that processor can, can change data to for a loan officer uh, and view all the loan officers within that branch. And of course you have the branch manager that has uh, uh, basically the read and write uh, access for the whole branch. So that's your four levels, which one may not exist in your branch, which is the processing. Because not everybody's going to have a, a branch processor. So that's the, that when you do the report, <clears throat> depending on your, your access right, you may or may not be able to see others. Okay, so that's kind of uh, the way that, that report's going to work and how you access it. And then uh, furthermore, even though you can see it, you may or may not be able to make changes to the file. So, and then you'll, you'll be able to see that. So um, Cecilia covered this. Do you guys have any questions before she goes? And uh, for those there, I'm going to pull up something for you here. And for those at home, you have any questions, I'll check back here in a second. But I wanted to, um, everybody here and at <coughs> on the webinar, if you do have any question, uh, go ahead and write this information down. For loan submission and condition, 
make sure that you want to uh, send it to central processing at my equity zone. Okay, so you uh, you will send everything to central processing at myequityzone.com. Now we'll go to the processor uh, on, on duty. Make sure you, you send it there because if you send it to Cecilia and she happens to take vacation for a week, your file's going to sit there. Um, I mean, not necessarily other people monitor, but, but just make sure you send it there. That central processing is an email distribution list. I will send it to all of the uh, processor. Uh, make sure if you like faxing instead of scanning and emailing it, you can fax it to 877-658-4248. Uh, Those number uh, is an e-fax. If you, sometime when you e-fax, using another e-fax service or, or voice over internet protocol, VOIP service, it won't communicate with each other. And whenever that happens, all our office, we have a different fax number. We have two other alternative fax number that we can give you to try. And you can always fax it to uh, ER, ERS Corporate, and they're here too. Okay? Um, so you can reach the to show directly at 916-469-3626. That will ring her and her email, Cecilia at My Equity Zone. You have Amy. Uh, she will assist uh, Cecilia with the processing. And her number is the 596-6656 with air code 916. And we have Amy at MyEquityZone.com. Now, the other person that will help you with your transaction coordinating, her name's Jeanette Mitchell. Um, she, you guys haven't met her, but one of the, you will hopefully we can introduce you guys. Uh, number is 596-6653. She goes by a nickname of Jeannie, so it's Jeannie at MyEquityZone.com. And as the volume builds up, uh, we'll bring our other processors on board and we'll introduce them to you. All right, thank you, Cecilia. Thank you. All right, so we're, we're really out of, uh, very low on time, so I'm gonna breeze through quite a bit, and I'm gonna kind of jam it down for you guys. I only got about 50 minutes with you guys, and we just barely covered the submission, so, um, again, you're, hopefully this is gonna get close and quick, because I'm gonna go pretty fast. Okay, guys, here's the agenda. I'm gonna go over this again with you. Uh, today, um, we're really trying to define the loan processor roles and responsibilities, cover preliminary title report, desktop originator, pre-approved letter, LOEs, loan submission form, stack and orders. Um, so those. To be honest with you, I don't want to kind of uh, skip the most important thing, which is the desktop originator. Uh, those are your system to tell your client are they are able to go look at homes or not. Are they able to refinance this month or wait a year? This is your, your really your, your sidekick on determining if a loan is good or not. So I don't want to kind of skim that. What I'm going to do for you guys is that um, I'm going to send you a packet of uh, seven uh, case studies that you guys can do along with the, the server and I'm going to give you an online uh, tutorial. I'm going to give you a lot more in-depth uh, and you guys can blaze through it, take your time, go through it yourself. But that is what you, you do out on the field. Um, you can always read guidelines. You can always say, well, DTI is you know, under 40%, it seems like credit score is 800, that loan to value is at 50%, you know, everything's great. But just because you think, you know, everything's good and you run into the system that you didn't cash in with maybe a, a late within the last 12 months, or maybe something happened, uh, it would deny the loan. So that's what you want to know. So, you know, and then we'll, um, I'll send you more information on that. So I'm going to cover uh, the preliminary target report because I believe, uh, you're, you're going to need to know this, and it can kill the deal right away if you look if you know how to read it. Okay, a lot of you guys are real estate agent, and I think I know that. Uh, show a raise your hand. How many guys are real estate agent? Two. Okay, we got three. Okay, I got four. All right, so we got two real estate. So we got a total of six real estate agent. Um, if you guys feel that this this preliminary title uh, report is is you already know it, that's fine. Um, we we we're going to cover it. There are materials in here that I'm going to pull up. So if you guys want to, if you guys want to get up, I will get offended. Just go ahead and you know take a break. It'll take me about 15 minutes to kind of cover the preliminary report for those that are are, are uh, needing to know that. Okay. So I'm gonna pull up. If you guys can pull up uh, this, open up this booklet here, and it's the colored booklet. It is the uh, steer title. Sacramento Placer, our account rep here uh, was kind enough to give us this. I think it's wonderful information. I'm not going to go through every nitty gritty. I'm just going to kind of tell you what to look out for in a mortgage loan transaction. I'm not going to cover everything. If you guys want to, at leisure, go ahead and uh, read all the little tips they have. Uh, this is one of the better 
one that I've seen that they put together. So um, it's pretty good. <coughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to, you can read the title insurance later. <clears throat> Again, I'm going to give you an idea of what red flags to look for. That, that's pretty much it. So kind of <clears throat> go over that. So as you pull up to, um, let me see what, what so this is, this is a sample preliminary tire report, which would be the first one. And if you go to, in your booklet, I believe it's at page six. So on page six, you would see um, a sample here. And what you're looking for in here is make sure that the property address, this, uh, the way I interpret it is this is a fax cover sheet. Basically, the, 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 title, the, the title company's uh, fax cover sheet. They can make changes to this, and they sometimes will misspell the property address. Make sure the property address matches uh, a few places. One is your loan application. Two is your appraisal report. Okay, so make sure those matches on those. Those are the three things that, that uh, you might have three different address. One of the three got a bunch if you got a discrepancy. Or two of the three got a bunch. So a lot of time appraisal will say, well, I got this from public record, and the appraisal might have messed up. You're going off of whatever information you have on the loan application. But if the title company and the appraiser is kind of not moving it off, you got to figure it out, guys. you got to figure out who's got the right data. And typically, I would say the title company has the right data, uh, not the, the appraiser. But the appraiser might give some permission that you got to research a little bit more. So pay attention to the property address. And uh, in, down here, on the, as I continue on here, um, you're looking at the vesting. If you see the vesting of somebody's name and they're missing the initial, that's fine. You know, they, they, can, always, they can always change it. But um, if they are refinancing, they need to explain why the discrepancy from last time we recorded versus now. They could have gotten married, they could have gotten an they could have became a citizen, they could have done a lot of things. Whatever that reason is, document it. You have to document it. And if they are unmarried and they got married from the last time they were on title, you need to ask them how they want to hold the vesting. This one, um, just because they have it from the last refinance, you don't know how long ago they, they had it, uh, just double check with them uh, which one is the correct one. Because when you draw docs and you go off this and, and they said they wanted something else, um, it's going to cause for a redraw. So make sure the, uh, the vesting, the, the name is spelled right, and the vesting. If you look, at this description here, it'll say lot and uh, unit number. This will tell you usually is it a detached single family resident, a detached. And uh, what I look for in there is any indication of a planned unit development. A planned unit development is where they share a common uh, common area. Uh, so the easiest way for you guys to remember is like an apartment complex. You have you have uh, you know building with the same wall, they have maybe a pool or a common area and they pay uh, you know, an HOA fee. The less, the less noticeable one would be some of these uh, community development. You don't see their they're single family home, but because somebody uh, did as a planned unit development, they have uh, a fee that they would pay. The reason why we look for that is to make sure we include any HOA uh, fee into our debt to income ratio. So make sure if you see anything that's a unit number, um, you want to do a little bit more research and see if there are any HOA. Okay. And the book number, you make sure you see the book 54 map number 25. Now this one needs to match the, la the last page you want to go to, which is the plat map. And if the plat map doesn't match, you need to get the plat map or have them adjust the wording. On those. Usually it's not the wording you ever have to judge, you just need to get the right platform. And the APN, this number you do want to match it up with your appraisal. So check always check the APN and <coughs> make sure that it matches. Again, discrepancy, somebody needs to resolve it. Whatever the description, the discrepancy, I always uh, make sure that, that I, I check directly with the county. In Sacramento County, very simple. Go to on the internet, type in Sacramento uh, County Assessor. Assessor, yeah, Sacramento. Yes, uh, it's, I don't remember. I just typed Google as Sacramento Assessor's office. But yes, he said Assessor. Assessor. Sacramento County. 
Yeah. Assessor.sacramentocounty.net. Uh, SacCounty.net. Sac um, but that is the one I go to whenever the discrepancy. I put the tax bill or I ask them for their property tax bill and I submit it to the underwriter, give it to the title, give it to the appraiser. And right now we can't communicate to the appraiser directly, guys. So you submit it to the lender, lender community to the appraisal management company, and they'll get a result. Okay. So um, whenever you go to the Schedule B where they talk about taxes, and, and what, what I'm referring to on this one is, is uh, a lot of refinance, if you're getting this, because you look at uh, a purchase, you do look at the same thing, and I'll kind of the differentiate between the two. But I'm a refinance, you want to look at the fiscal year, make sure that this is our fiscal year. Now, pop quiz, when does the uh, property tax period begin? What month and what day? When does it begin and when does it end? July. July. July 1st. Yeah. You got it. July 1st is the beginning of the tax period. So July 1st and it ends on June 30th. Okay? So that's the first. So you will always see the year coming in. So for example, we are in the tax year 2013 to 2014. Okay? Now what's the first due date of your first month? We got February 10th. We got the first due date. First installment, which carries from July 1st. First November 10th. November 10th. November, actually, it's November 1st oh, is the due date. December. It's delinquent when? Oh, uh, December 10th. December 10th. So it's delinquent December 10th. Uh, due date on the uh, second installment is due February 1st. What do you guys know? Uh, what is it? When is it late? When is March, it late? March 10th. April 10th. So skip two months just because <coughs> February is a shorter month. So they give you a little bit more time. Okay. So that's the date that you gotta always know because uh, that cheat sheet I gave you a while back, you guys should reference that. It's telling you first installment due, second installment due. And if you don't know what first installment and second mean, because remember July 1st through December 31st is the first installment. It's actually the second half of our calendar year. It's actually the first installment. And then you got the second installment, which is January 1st through June 30th. That's the second installment. So you guys got to know those dates, okay? So when you're looking at the, the, the fiscal year, look for that. Any lien that is due, uh, this one will show you paid and open. Paid, uh, I mean self-explanatory, open, and you can see it on there. It'll say due February 1st and the link with April 10th. And you need to know when are we closing escrow. Whenever you close escrow, um, you got to kind of predict the liquid date because, uh, and this also applies to, to mortgage payment. If you, if you close escrow on the 16th, what, what is the mortgage payment that's due on the first? When is it late? You guys know? The 15th. The 15th. So if you close on the 16th, money that's getting this first two days later, you just incur a late fee that you probably didn't factor into the payoff event. Now we're short to close. So you got to make sure that these dates, you got to understand these, these delinquent dates, okay? So delinquent on property tax is important uh, because if they don't have enough money to come in, you got to increase the equity, they don't have the equity, you know, they're going to borrow from a friend, they're going to withdraw from the credit, they've got to do something. Okay, so anticipate those things. Make, pay attention to the installment date. And down here, we'll go to the next sample. So now we're on page seven. For those that have not read a preliminary tax report, uh, I'm the type of guy I will always instruct you guys to read it. You've never seen a document ever, you never read that document, read it. Sit there, dissect it, understand it, and keep going until you know, kind of just by glancing what it's already going to say. Okay, so take your time, all your preliminary title report, and look at it. You're going to run through a lot of different types of scenarios on preliminary title report. I run into new scenarios all the time. And, and so pay attention to it, but read these things here. Uh, what, you, what you are looking for are any type of, um, any Melaroos. You see Melaroos are, are um, I guess, tax assessed for a newly developed area to build sidewalk, to build uh, city lights, to build schools in. And it's just a commitment from the neighborhood to make sure it's funded. And it's a time period, and sometimes they'll, they'll renew it. Okay, so make sure you do that because if that is did not included on your estimated 1.25% tax, property tax, and there's another 200 bucks, that will affect your debt to income ratio. So look out for Melrose on these, these here, okay? Um, so you see these supplemental tax, uh, it'll probably say Melrose. You see that word Melrose right here? 
the same algorithms, you need to find out how much is it. And in this case, they have 110 bucks uh, for a supplemental for, for that, that case. Okay. Um, utility, there are, there are also um, easement, if you want to take a look at that. So this is an easement that allows, an easement is just a, 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 a authority for the government or an entity to uh, get over your land, you know, basically trespass over your land to get to a, a certain point. So there is, and you'll see a lot of utility easement, but the one thing that you want to look out for is any type of, of easement that, that can uh, possibly uh, reduce the value of, of, your, of your property. So uh, if let's say they had, had like five acres of land, and then for whatever reason the easement takes up four acres and they're, they're getting appraised for five, I mean that's gonna, that's gonna affect the value, right? So you gotta make sure, like anything like that, you just gotta be, be careful. Uh, covenant conditions and restriction, otherwise known as CCNRs, are, are usually for HOA or planned unit development. Whatever that happened, and this is probably the worst stuff I'm gonna give you, but you gotta actually pick up a CCNR in about 100, 200 pages, and just flip through it. I, I'm not gonna tell you read through it, but flip through it, and, and just understand what it means. Like they'll have restriction of use, uh, home base, home base business. Uh, what night? You know, what noise level per night? You got to know all this stuff because there are some weird ones out there that will affect that. You got to get the water through to refinance. You see that, and I've seen it. Where you, if they refinance it, that you have to actually go to the board to get an approval. So there are something like that, and uh, I'm not saying that it happens. And you got to check everyone, but just look through it. Okay. And on here, this is what you want to look look for. Is that on 1998 they got a loan uh, for 108,000? Okay, it reported on October 7th and it was dated on September 8th. Uh, that's who the bank is. You want to see who the first lien is. You got to match up with your credit report. If it didn't, they probably sold the loan. So you just want to make sure that you have the right vendor. And this is where you will find out. This guy never told me he had he had a ten thousand dollar second mortgage. Right? So then you're like, uh oh, this effect, I'm at 90% loan to value, now the price they gave me was invalid because I'm at, now my loan to value is 92 or whatever the percentage, right? So make sure you take a look at all the deed of trust to determine if they have a first, a second, a third, and in this case, they actually have a, a third, uh, I mean a, a tax lien. So it, 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 they have a third lien. It's not a mortgage, but it's something that's clouding the title. And the way that the lien works is, First in line to collect the handout once the, the property is sold. Um, so first first lien holder, second lien holder, third lien holder. So these people are going to be in line to collect it. And if this, if we refinance and we pay this guy off, everybody moves up one rank, right? So then, without getting getting a what is called a lease subordination agreement, they will move up automatically. If we want to refinance and they want to keep the second, they need to go call Mr. Golden One here and say, hey, um, we're going to refinance, we need to maintain first position, what is your requirement to maintain a second lien position? It will give you a checklist, a resubordination agreement, this is what I need, it's usually an approval, an appraisal, a prelim, and a credit, it's everything you submit to the lender, the first time, basically. And, and then they will reiterate it and say, great, everything looks good, we will we'll maintain our second lien position. And it costs about 100 to 250 kind of lender in order for them to do that process. So if you have somebody that does have a second mortgage that they <coughs> keep it, for example, they've had this line of credit for 100000 with a zero balance. <coughs> so I have to have it for any day. I don't owe anything on it, but I just have it. So usually, uh, they got it like maybe five, seven years ago. If you submit that in, the lender, the second lender, might reduce that 100000 to maybe 50000 or whatever the case may be. So just be prepared to tell your borrower if I submit this, they might reduce your line of credit. But now that more information, that might, uh, that might change what the credit limit might be. Right? So tax lien always got to be paid off. You guys got to uh, talk to them about that. And, and um, if they make a payment arrangement with the IRS or the government, whoever it is, that's fine. But that's still got to be removed. So if they make payment arrangement, they need to uh, temporarily remove it so that we can close the deal and then put it back on. That's fine too. But it cannot be on there. We need to have a preliminary tire report 
that show that it's not moving. So on this plant map that we have, um, we will look at that book here. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit here. This is the book number that we're talking about. It'll say Sessor Map Book 251, page 7. And as I go back to uh, about page 6, I believe, you want to make sure that it matches up here. It'll say Record Book 54 of that, right? So there is uh, there's a problem with the book, and then there is this here. So there it is. Let me pull it up. All right. Um, you guys have any questions regarding what to look out for in your limited title report? You guys make sure how many leads they have. Check the APN number, property address. And then this one doesn't have it, but I wanted to, uh, and at the end, you'll see, oh, I actually have something there for this. There's a little cheat sheet for you guys uh, in that book. Uh, the date that we talked about. Okay. And this one, um, whatever you're, you're asking for the best thing, and they ask you, what do you think? You have to say this, guys. You can get in trouble. I'm not an attorney. I can't give you legal advice, but here's a handout that you can discuss with your attorney. Because there are tax consequences and legal consequences if, uh, depending on how they hold title. So uh, there are, they're, they're usually your, your tenancy in common, your joint tenancy, com community property, community property, you know, both and little trust. There's eight of them, but here's only the single, not five of them. So do not give any advice. Uh, if anything happens, they'll come back to you. Uh, there's a lot more information here, but I, I wanted to kind of give you the obvious uh, red flags to look out for. So there's another sample in there um, that you have, which is a, a printout, and that that printout is uh, marked up here, and it says uh, for the happy buyer, right, the happy seller. <coughs> uh, it has a little bit more. This is, we'll say, Mr. Happy Seller, Mary Van. I want to give you another sample for you guys to kind of look through and do it as an exercise for kind of what we talked about. Let's go over that one without me kind of going through it with you and see if you have any questions. So this one is more for training purposes, kind of kind of throw you off a little bit. What I gave you was more of kind of the explanation of what it is. Okay. So uh, for those at at uh, on a webinar, uh, again, if you want to, just go ahead and send it to uh, send an email to green team at myequityzone.com uh, and Amy will send you all the training material that we're presenting today. Um, desktop originator, this is what I'm giving you guys. Um, so part of what we want to do is I'm going to talk about pre-approval letter. The pre-approval letter is for purchase. Uh, you don't need it for refinance is uh, and we primarily only require DO, desktop originator, uh, and it's interchangeable with desktop underwriter. Desktop underwriter is the lender's version, desktop originator is the broker version, one and the same. Okay? So I'm going to call DO, when you talk to the lender, they call it DU. They're talking about the same system. DO, you need it in order to issue your pre approved letter. So let me show you, if you flip to the last page of that packet that you guys have, so this is your, our pre approved letter. Again, all of these have our logo on it. We're in the process of exchanging all of the legality. So let, let's read it together. Um, and I want you to know what this is. Uh, for when you're buying a house, a realtor will not make an offer unless they know you've secured your financing. And uh, if you have cash, if you're paying cash, you want to see a bank statement or wherever you're getting the down payment or where you're going to uh, withdraw the money. If you're getting financing, they want to see this. And it's a pre approval letter, and I'm going to read it for you. Um, is the it, due to the current uh, mark or the current planning credit market? This loan approval is only valid for 30 calendar days. Please request an updated loan approval directly from ECM thereafter. This is things happen every 30 days, and pay stubs are only good for 30 days. Bank statements are only good for day for 30 days. Once that 30 day has passed, it's simple. Give me an updated bank statement. Give me an updated pay stub. If your credit report has, has exceeded uh, 90 days or 120 days, depending on lender, we just need a new one. Once you give me that, nothing changed, I'll issue you an updated one, okay? So that's why we do that. Uh, some lenders will just do four months, and that's fine too. Uh, we just err on the safe side. And on this, it will say when it was issued, uh, when it expired 30 days later. 
uh, is issued to Mr. Happy Buyer, buying 123 Elm Street, Sacramento. Now, if you don't have that property address yet, there's no uh, property of interest. This is one of those who will start looking. You would put to be determined where the address would be. Okay. This uh, pre approved letter would just state that thanks for uh, choosing, in, in this case, the Realty uh, Relief Mortgage for your home loan needs. You have received automated underwriting approval uh, for FHA loan with a purchase price of 179 with 6265 down payment. This letter, letter, uh, letter confirmed that your credit, asset, and income have been received, verified, and approved. Again, it goes back to our CIA. Credit, income, and asset. You have to verify that before you issue uh, the pre-approval letter. A pre-qualification is just based upon what they told you verbal. You need to substantiate that with uh, their documentation. And it, it, there are there are requirement uh, that or condition is that the borrower has been uh, approved, but the property has not. The property needs to be in an acceptable um, uh, condition for the appraisal to be appraised uh, correctly. So it's subject to a satisfactory appraisal, subject to a uh, a clean title report, nothing clouding it, clouding the title, uh, no derogatory change through the income, credit, or asset and complies with all the conditioned lenders. Some stuff that is uh, up to the underwriter's discretion, what they're going to call, but we don't know what it is. No change in marketing conditions. Sometimes a, a tornado, hurricane, comes and wipes out the neighborhood. That's the type of kind of marketing condition or natural disaster that can happen. Uh, for example, homes in, uh, I want to say, kind of like the Zoo Assembly area with the, the ring of fire, I guess. I mean, those would be on, on the lender's list now. So anything in that area, they would put a little code, and we have it that, that ability to do it in Kelly's Point too, is that in the affected area, there would be an alert, checking the, the, the natural disaster uh, sheet to make sure that your property is not affected. So those are the thing where it protects us. And of course, if, um, if let's say you got pre-approved in May, and now you're still finding a home, market uh, interest rate has increased by over a percent, right, from that time ago. So that would say no significant increase in the pre-approval interest rate. So it protects us um, in, in any of these, these times where we did issue it and it was valid at that time. And that's why I say check with us every uh, 30 days. Because I, I've seen people do for four months and for now, technically, if somebody issued me one in, in May and it's in September, my, my approval is still valid, but so much has changed since then. So please note that the lenders underwriting will issue the final loan commitment, final uh, loan approval, assume no material change to the financial package. And it says down here, this pre-approved letter is not a loan, uh, loan commitment. The actual loan commitment cannot be obtained until all the lender conditions have been uh, properly satisfied. So I want to be clear to you guys that um, a lot of companies, small companies, um, they get a bad rap for letting anybody have access to this. And then you have small companies send it out, realtor makes an offer for one of the client, and over and over again, they, they get to the signing table, something falls out. And then enough, enough uh, upset from real estate agents, they start talking, they start saying, I'm not going to accept any pre-approval letter from company XYZ. It never, it never goes through. So we want to protect the ERS brand and make sure that not everybody will be able uh, to issue this without the proper training. Okay. And I just want to kind of sing, the, sing to you guys that we need to have a standard make sure that everybody here has a, a level of professional, level of knowledge base, the, the very basic of the fundamental of the, uh, foundation training. Okay? So don't, I, I, I just don't want to come across as being kind of big brother and, and holding everything tightly. It's not my intention. My intention is let's, let's get a good, good group of you guys that, that from there we can kind of just grow it out there and make sure that we have that, that, that high level of standard. So in order to get access to this pre approval letter, you're going to all start with making sure that um, you, you work with the processing. If you know how to run DU, perfect. You don't need any training. But all we request is you give us three good uh, DU findings upon those submissions. You can demonstrate that you can do that on your own, we'll give you the pre approval letter. Okay. Now how do you get to get three DU pre approval letter? We're going to give you this um, here. I want to show you. So in here, just ask, um, ask Amy tomorrow, uh, specifically in there, there are two training uh, tutorials. And you need to watch those. If you know it, that's fine. You don't need to watch this stuff. This is meant for somebody who, who and it's long, so um, 
you know, we'll email it. Uh, just request for, send it to Green Team, say, can I get the uh, DO training? Just put DO training, she'll know what to do. Uh, this won't be part of the training material unless you ask for it specifically, because it's pretty large. There's two video. Um, one will be interpreting the unwriting finding, and then one is for Refi Plus. I know some of you guys have interest in ARP, Home Affordable Refinance Program. There's a different way to run it through the engine. And then the other one is just uh, running it through the, the system by itself. Okay. From there, you're, um, we will give you, uh, this is an introduction to the practice. This is what you're going to do. Um, and we, I have already downloaded all this here. And these are clickable uh, here if you want to just download it for yourself. But I'm going to email you all this. And this is the input file for you to, when you open it, you can import it to, to Calix. So this here, <coughs> when you extract it and you open Calix point, you just point it to that, then it will fill in your channel 3 so you don't have to type everything. Okay? These are all practice cases. Um, you're going to get the, the loan application with all that information here. So you have a loan application, and you'll, you'll be running it uh, a mock trial to kind of get the, the same result that they did. So here's the loan application. They have all this documentation. And in, in that, uh, not only you get the loan application, you get a little bit, bit of a, a background. And this one is a 95% rate purchase loan. This one is a uh, limited cash out refinance. This one is a uh, cash out refinance and you're keeping, like in the scenario I said, the $100,000 with zero balance, you're keeping the second open and a lot of people do this. So how do you run that kind of scenario? Uh, the My Community Mortgage Program, which will give you up to 97% loan to value, was very competitive. If they have the high credit score, they don't have any um, uh, short sales or foreclosure. Um, this is a pretty competitive product to the FHA. Uh, program. People go to FHA usually because of derogatory credit or low down payment. There is a low down payment uh, through Fannie Mae. And uh, all the, the end result is give me three DU finding that you did yourself. And at a pass with flying colors when I go to the loan submission, I know you guys don't have to run it at that time. We'll give you the pre approval template. You're going to sign a form for us to make sure that you uh, understand, understand that any, any um, I guess, pre approval letter that resulted in a lawsuit complaint is all. And it really is because you guys are responsible for that. Okay. We're going to cover uh, loan or letter of explanation. LOE, you guys just got to know it stands for letter of explanation. I know a lot of you should don't get abbreviated, but it's LOE. You're going to hear that a lot. What is wrong with their credit? Why did they uh, go, maybe, why did they go get another type of credit uh, somewhere else? They got an inquiry on their credit. Uh, why do they have a $500 deposit in their banking account? Stuff like that. Those are letter of explanation you need to tell to the underwriter. So I'm going to cover um, letter of explanation. These are in, in your packet. I want to say that you do have um, your inquiries, your LOEs for inquiries. And then on the back of that LOEs, I'm going to, uh, let me just make sure the people at home can see it. So this is our, our typical letter that I like to use, um, but the one that you have in your packet, let me show you. What, what I'm showing to you guys here, the printed packet is more of a standard form. Um, and this will just explain the date of the inquiry, which on the credit report you'll we'll see, the name of the creditor, why did they do it. Most of the time we say this mortgage, because when you pull your credit, your, our own inquiry will show up there. And you want to make sure that you just say this mortgage. Did they get a new uh, account? Usually no, but they got approved for $10,000 credit limit. Um, you don't actually put the, the credit limit, you just put zero if they didn't charge it up. Then you want to put the current balance. Uh, I mean, if they did get it, then you want to put this uh, or the balance along with the monthly payment. This will affect the DTI, and that's why they want to ask you about it. I typically don't use this form. You can, it's, it's, it's fine as a standard form. I typically like to make sure that it looks uh, a little bit more personal. Uh, personable, and then you put this here, the letter name in, and you put that. It just look more like you took the time to, to do it instead of using the form. Okay. Then the next one that you're going to see on behind is AKA letter, which is uh, also known as. If they have another name that shows up on the credit report, you want us to write down all the different variations. Even though it's misspelled, it's obvious that it was misspelled. You got to make sure you put it on the bottom. I am not known as. Okay? 
So make sure you just type it in. It's very simple. Like all name, and then just ask them, were you ever, you know, uh, this name? Or if they are, put on top. If they said that's a misspelling, put on top. Right? They always ask for these. These are just standard uh, protocol. And the third one is derogatory credit. So you'll see the derogatory template. And all this is fillable. You guys can just hit tab and it'll go field to field just like this. On your derogatory credit, if you go to the account, no matter how old it is, we'd like to address Okay, we just, just really want to say what the name is, account number, uh, status shown in the credit report, and explain it. And usually one explanation will overflow. You should be lost a job and it affects all of those derogatory. Just kind of copy and paste that, that explanation. Okay. Um, the last one is for large deposit. And the large deposit, I just gave you got an example here. Uh, it'll say that the deposit on, and, and whatever date is on your bank statement on the left side, uh, and the amount you put the date on. I deposited, I said the deposit on August 31st to my bank America account, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, was a combination of $3,000 and 500. I withdrew 3,000 to lend to my son for dental service, but he decided not to go through with it. I then deposited uh, the cash back to my account. The additional 500 was given to me from my son to hold uh, for him in my bank account. So you want to explain to them why, you know, why is there a deposit other than the payroll? Okay, so anything outside of the pay normal payroll is considered a large deposit. And then let me see here. Of course, you have your general uh, letter of explanation. You can just write whatever that they they have a uh, question about that you feel that they're going to have questions about. This is. Uh, everything that I explained to you is at the beginning of the loan submission. The more you tell the story, the easier uh, you can make it for the right to approve your Okay. Desktop, I really, I, I was hoping that I could do the DO training and actually give you a live spin on, on actually how it works and what it looks like. Uh, but uh, based upon what I did the credit income and asset, and there's a lot of personal information, um, the best I can do is that, that case where it really is a mistake information. Okay, so that's all I can give you without running it down. If you want a live uh, glance of how it looks like, schedule that one-on-one -on -one meeting with Cecilia after you get the CIA because it's different than when you run into it here because this is the perfect kind of test case scenario. Your 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 uh, your client probably not going to fit that mold. There's all something that, that they don't explain. Um, some of it will be for FHA sponsorship ID. It's just putting it in the wrong spot and give you the denial. Those stuff, I mean, they, they probably mention in here, but in, in real life, you probably don't know what's going on. So stuff, stuff like those things, uh, you probably want that hands-up training. So I, I do encourage you guys uh, if, if that to refinance. Uh, there are still people who want to refinance for cash out with the equity of those stuff. That's probably the next wave that I've ever seen. Uh, low rate people who have refinanced within the last three to five years have got better rate than today. So you're probably not going to capture those people you're going to capture people who want to consolidate their uh, their home equity line of credit as the rate goes up. Their, their three and a quarter is going to be 5%, 7%, 8%, and so forth. They'll probably consolidate it just to make it a fixed rate. You're going to probably run into somebody who, who was upside down, now they have equity, they want to pull out, pay off the car, pay off the debt, the credit card. So those are the type of refinance you're going to probably run into, um, not to just lower the rate or the monthly payment, because the rate is starting to get back up. Then, right? That doesn't mean that, that doesn't exist. So I want you guys to focus on the purchase market. That's what the whole uh, mortgage industry is focused on, on the purchase market. So you guys should learn how to issue pre-approval right on the spot. And issuing pre-approval, what I used to do um, for my real estate agent, how I, I, I gave them something of value and a service, is that I would go to their open house, get my laptop, get a Wi-Fi connection, and I would, I would offer free pre-approval, meaning I would pay for the credit report. So I would uh, have people come in, have, are you pre-approved? And they would say, no, I'm not. I said, you know, normally uh, the cost of the credit report, if you went online, would be 30 bucks for us. It's, you know, we know it's 50 bucks. But I would say, upsell and say, if you got a copy of the credit report, about 30 bucks, I can give that to you for free. Give you, uh, I just need 15 minutes of your time. They sit down there, I get a, a prospect, uh, and then if, if they go look at the house, I can issue the pre approval right on the spot. And then if, if they really like it, they make an offer right then. So, so go ahead. But to give the pre approval, don't you have to have that? actual documentation of their income and stuff like that. You, so do. You, you do. And then for, for those, when you have those actual documentation, uh, some people, believe it or not, they actually can access it or they have it right in the okay. car. 
they're at they're at that point where they're actually uh, so you can have two, which is a prequal, and we have a prequal letter. What I show you with a pre-approval letter. So a prequal letter, you can you would issue to them and you say based upon what you, you said, now I just need this checklist. So we'll give them a prequal for those who don't have documentation. But a lot of times when they're looking at neighborhood, the funny thing is you get a lot of people who live in the neighborhood and they just kind of walk over mm -hmm. and take a look and, and they were renting down the street. They just go down to the house again and come back. So we usually actually do it. I actually get the documentation then. And then what you want to probably do is, um, back then I used to lug around this little uh, printer where you know you put a scanner and all stuff. But nowadays you take your phone and you just take a picture of every single documentation. You know, so it's not that, that hard for you to collect documentation. Um, and I encourage you guys to partner up with some of the PRS agents here, offer to do open houses, get pre-approved, learn the system, and, and earn the privilege to start issuing out pre-approval. So I really encourage you guys to do that. Do that right away. Take those courses, learn DO, get 3D finding, sit with uh, Cecilia, make sure she flip your thing. Once she approved that you know how to do DO, trust me, she doesn't want to re run DO for you guys. So she wants to encourage you guys to learn how to do it yourself. That should issue that pre-approval letter. Okay, so uh, that's the way that, that has, that's how you're going to earn your business. That is that is what the market is dictating. Look at all the lender ratio. Guess what they're promoting? Purchase special, 21-day closing, uh, two-week closing. It's all purchase right now, guys. So you got to get in there. Just get in the game, beat the market, and then you'll be fine. I just did a webinar with Homebridge this morning. Good. Just... Okay. And uh, by the way, uh, lender's presentation. Um, I have, give me some, some programs that you guys want to know, uh, and I'll set it up. I have people who, who can offer a part, uh, uh, FHA 2 and 3K, basic uh, mortgage, mortgage uh, you know, 101, kind of what we've been doing, but uh, so I don't think we really need that. Um, you know, basic uh, jumbo loans, or let's say. What's the most common loan out there right now? So you want to know the common loan? Uh, right now, you, should, you guys should all know FHA. You, gotta, you guys, I think you guys should know FHA. That's, that's a good starting point. Not the renovation loan, the FHA 203K. But once you know FHA, it just gives you another option for people with uh, uh, derogatory credit, people with low down payment. So, I mean, everybody wants that 20% down here credit score, you know, mm -hmm. the 40 DTI. Everybody wants that. That's the prime. And then, yes, if you get it, that's your market. It's perfect. But you just got to know the niche, too. Can we do that and then compare it to the conventional program that also has the Normally, they'll do both. So I'm going to do your, your basic training, which is conventional and FHA. And so what happened is that we do what is called FHA training, and then it'll, uh, it'll, it'll roll into kind of contrasting the conventional order to conventional contrast to FHA. So I can get that basic FHA, but it's called FHA training. It's just because you've got to kind of do so something. So with the conventional, the low down payment, what is that called? Is that agency? No, see, um, if you talk about that, that's a whole new program like my community. Uh, okay. You have your, your Path, which will require uh, you know, no appraisal, no MI, stuff like that. Those are all different product guys, and that, that required 32 point five to an hour for each loan program. Let's start with the fundamental. I want to get up a, a roll call on what you guys want. I'm going to check online too, but Kenny, did you, you said you had a question? Do so you cover reverse mortgage? Reverse mortgage? That is very advanced, but yes, I think that I'm going to take it sequentially, but I'm going to have it for everybody, whatever you guys want. It's, it's going to be like uh, one every day for the next three weeks. You guys can go wherever you guys want to go. But I'm just gonna, I just need requests from you guys. And if I say stay with, start with basic. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Actually, uh, somebody said that we have reverse mortgage lender. We are approved with yes. The answer is yes. You. So the mentorship suggestion is with 50-50. Uh, and that 50-50 means the mentor gets 75 basis point. And the loan officer gets 75 basis for what's going to be up to you and the mentor, and whoever that mentor in the branch will be. And again, right now, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of letting each branch do the mentorship, but if they want to do corporate, uh, I'm right now the only one that I would probably say I do the mentorship with you guys. Uh, if you want to have you uh, walk, you know, hold your hand on every file. And, but the difference with me is I will uh, take you through the basic when it goes to the actual hands on. I will direct you to my staff and say, hey, you can walk me through this. But you have always have access to to do that. Okay. Um, and there was a question. Uh, I, 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 that's my favorite. Can we do FHA or do we need some extra FHA? No, FHA. Um, 
quick and loan, for example, uh, and I was getting clarification on this, was that uh, the rule with FHA is that you have to be uh, an employee, and usually when you're an employee, uh, it also mandates that you're W-2. Uh, wage earner, it's a nightmare. You guys have ever done accounting on that part to do W-2? So 1099, especially for commission real estate mortgage, is the preferred method. Um, but there's always a gray area regarding the, um, is it 1099 uh, legal or W-2? So I've been checking with HUD, BRE, DBO, and with some lenders. So the answer I'm getting is that uh, we can do 1099, uh, but I got to confirm. So I just want to let you know, there is no extra certification and we are, in a sense, um, affiliated with the actual sponsor, which is the lender. So the lender would have to have W-2. They would have their FHA certification. So um, there is no cert additional certification for FHA. However, the exception is 203K. Most lender, in order for you to do 203K, uh, which is a, a section of the HUD handbook, uh, it's, it's for renovation loan. And to sum it up, it'll give you $35,000 to renovate the house six months after you purchase it. Okay, so you don't, it doesn't have to be moved and ready. That one you have to get certified by the lender. And certified is just taking a class like you do right now. And it answers some question and then you're certified. Okay? Um, same thing with down payment assistance program. There, there are those that you can get certified for. Uh, the reverse mortgage lender Lynn, is, that you're, you're asking about who it is, um, I, I want, I'll direct you to Cecilia, but more, I think, um, who is it here? Uh, you know Sanjeev? I think he does that too. And then I'll find out for you. Then. I'll send you that that list of the lender. And by the way, the reverse mortgage, you can get paid six, eight, ten points on a deal. You know, we're talking about on a four hundred thousand dollar loan, you can get paid twenty, four thousand, forty thousand dollars on the loan. It's very lucrative, but also it's 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 uh, it's very it's very. Uh, I guess you got to go to the class, and not, not a lot of people will succeed in that. People say they do it, but they really don't know what to do. So you guys want that class? Very lucrative. Okay, so reverse mortgage, uh, in a nutshell, you can use it to buy a house too, but what I'm going to tell you about is that uh, it pays you. You don't have a mortgage payment every month. So the equity in the house, over 30 years, it's going to pay you a certain amount every month. When you pass, either your, your, your heirs will uh, take over the payment and pay off the loan uh, because now it's a balance uh, higher than they would be in Europe. So it's meant for retiring. People who retired, they don't want a mortgage payment, they actually need to live off that in their house. That's a reverse mortgage. Okay. Alright, it's 833. Do you guys uh, have any questions before we call it a night? Okay, uh, I'm going to post this up here with the, if you guys need the Training material, go ahead and send it here. All right, guys, thank you for coming. And next week, next week.